Well, welcome to Farm Dog, another episode uh, where I am super excited to talk to Gary Williams. Gary is a rancher and a dog and horse trainer out of California. He is also an author, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but maybe the focus of tonight's conversation is Gary is a longtime breeder and trainer and user of McNabb dogs. Um, and so I wanted to just say welcome to Gary to the conversation. I'm excited to, to visit with you tonight. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate the opportunity. Gary, um, maybe we should just answer this question real quick because we're going to keep using the terminology tonight. Do you prefer the term McNabb dog or McNabb shepherd or something else? Because they go by a bunch of different names. A uh, McNabb dog works for me. Okay. Great. So we're going to we're going to use the term McNabb dog. Do you have a is there a reason why you prefer McNabb dog versus McNabb shepherd? You know what? Uh, because of the history of the McNabb, uh, Alexander McNabb bringing the dogs here in 1868. Uh, the, the breed was named after him. And uh, even though they were a fox shepherd, uh, the McNabb dog has has pretty much stuck as uh, a name that cowboys and, and ranchers recognize. Okay. That's a great segue. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about the history of the McNabb dog, how it came to be in the United States, and you know, maybe in particular how it came to be kind of like California's herding dog? Yeah, well, he uh, Alexander McNabb, when he came here, he settled in Mendocino County. And named his ranch, the McNabb Ranch. And through many years of, of uh, uh, the dog history, after he started crossing his dogs into what they called the Spanish Shepherd, which was a short haired version of the Border Collie that the uh, Bass Sheep Herders brought. Now, different line of Border Collies uh, came from Spain rather than from England. So they were the short haired version of the Border Collie. And that's what uh, Alexander McNabb preferred was the short haired dogs because of the heat. And, uh, and so he crossed them into, into, into that line. And at that point, everybody knew the dogs were as McNabb's. Okay, well, that's helpful. Um, Gary, maybe just t tell us a little bit about your history and, um, you know, your history with horses and ranches and working as a cowboy and then how that eventually led to your introduction to the McNabb. I I've uh, taken it, I've had the opportunity to read uh, most of your book and I think that that's a, a really interesting story. That was very interesting because I've had all breeds of dogs and of course I'm a dog trainer as well and I train all breeds of dogs. but. Uh, Growing up, we had Queensland Blue Heelers, then later on Border Collies. And my dad and I purchased a ranch together in Butte Falls, Oregon. And I'd been there several years and then all of a sudden this strange dog showed up in my yard. And this, our ranch was not close to town at all. And, and my nearest neighbor was five miles down the road. So, I put up signs for lost dog and, and went into town and put up more signs and, and ran a little ad in a paper about this dog being lost. And he was kind of standoffish. He wouldn't let me pet him, but he let me feed him. Well, every morning I'd get up, saddle my horses and I'd ride off with my two border collies. And the dog would just sit on my front porch, watch me right away. And nobody responded to the ads. Month went by. One day I saddled my horse. As I was riding off, I looked back to see where my border collies were and there was that dog. I thought, well, he wants to come along. We'll let him come along, see what he, what he knows anything or what. But, <laughs> and it just happened to be I was running a bunch of yearlings that day and boy, they were wild. They were spooky and my border collies ran out ahead of them to get them stopped and these cattle were just running right over the top of the border collies. And even though the border collies were trying their best to, to get them stopped, all of a sudden this dog took out along 
headed those cattle off and and as he was heading them off he was grabbing them by the nose as he was going by and he pretty soon he circled everything up and just held them all in a tight little group i go wow i like this dog <laughs> so anyway another month went by and i'm using this dog and i'm thinking perfect you know nobody's ever ever going to want this dog this is my dog all of a sudden some guy drove in the yard and he goes you haven't seen a dog he says it fell out of the back of my truck up a couple months ago and i pointed over there at that dog and he says yeah that's my dog and he called him and obviously the dog knew the guy and ran right to him and i said what kind of dog is that he says that's a mcnab i said wow i really like that dog i says i've never seen anything like him or work like him and uh, i says what i almost wish you hadn't come to find him he says well i'll tell you what he says i i just had a brand new litter of puppies you can have your pick and so that was my first McNabb, and that was back in 1973. And I've had McNabs ever since. Been raising them and and uh, and using them as working cattle, and and uh, they're just the the best dog. Now, be honest with me. Did you give any thought to the idea of just pretending that you'd never seen him, never seen that dog wander on your place? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. <laughs> I said, did you give any thought to lying to the guy and say, no, I never saw a dog. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I mean, obviously, the the, the dog was didn't belong to me. But, uh, right. but I sure wanted to know what kind of brute dog he was, that's for sure. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about that story is that um, you you kind of originated in California, you went to Oregon and you came upon this California California herding dog in Oregon, and you you never had any experience with that breed before. That's correct. That's correct. And I'll tell you what: in those days, people didn't know what a McNab was. I mean, most people they they had no clue. When you'd say that's a McNab, they go, "What is that?" And so well, it was very difficult for me to get my breeding program started. So the only way that I could do that was I'd find dogs that looked like a McNabb, but the only way that I could tell for sure was their working style. They worked like that dog that I had, where he'd go to the front, stop everything and circle them automatically, which was his instinct to do. Uh, then I'd put them in my breeding program. If they didn't, I'd go ahead and train them and sell them. But in those days, they didn't have DNA. Now we have DNA. And so I have 14 breeding dogs, four different lines of McNabs that came from different, different bloodlines. And I've had all 14 of my dogs DNA tested. And all 14 came back McNabs. Really, but what really impressed me was the fact that they, because of the DNA testing, they all came back negative for 150 plus generic diseases, which showed me that my breeding program is working, because I I really am very careful as to what lines of dogs I breed into, and they're not all all the same. Uh, I've seen a lot of program problems with. Uh, hip dysplasias, hyperness, and other other problems that have led to uh, inbreeding. And so I'm very careful about that. And so I have registered my dogs in the National Stock Dog Registry for the last, oh, 30 plus years. And that way I keep a, a record of their uh, history of their, their family so that I don't cross back into them. And so it's very important uh, to do that as, to health-wise. And that being said, because of the four different lines of McNabs that I have, I have, you know, you can't classify all McNabs as one particular dog. In other words, I've got dogs, one in particular that I, that his, ancestry came directly from the McNabb ranch and I call him my redneck car alarm with bike 
I put him in the back of the pickup. I guarantee you nobody steals anything out of my truck. <laughs> and then I have another line that I bought from a, a McNabb breeder out of Missouri. If you want to steal my saddle, he'll help you carry it to your pickup. He is so friendly. He is so friendly. He's almost obnoxious. But they have this have one thing in common. They work cattle exactly the same. They have that McNabb unique working style. Yes, and that's what what it's all about. So let's go back to that a little bit. Like it amazes me that you were you know selecting dogs for your program. Uh, without really knowing their genetic heritage, you are using as your, your key selection criteria their working style. And now you've ended up with dogs that can be DNA tested, and you've kind of proven that identifying them by their working style is a pretty accurate way of knowing what their genetics are. Um, so what what is unique about their, their working style? You talked about it a little bit, but what do you say... Well, let's just compare them to, you know, a border collie. What makes you say that that is a distinct working style of a McNabb versus a border border collie? Let's that's probably the easiest one to start with. Yeah, probably. Uh, the border collie they they have a very pretty working style. There's nothing pretty about a, a McNabb. <laughs> I call them. Let's get the job done and go home. Border uh -huh. collies, they want to circle wide and they sneak and they lay down and they eye the cattle. And, and if you understand what eyeing the cattle is, they stare at the cattle. And they intimidate, intimidate the cattle by staring at them and they creep forward and try to intimidate their uh, the livestock. McNabs work upright on their toes. There's no sneak. There's no... There's nothing pretty about them. Those cattle are running wide open. They take the shortest route, go to the front, grab them by a nose, stop them, circle them up, and hold them. It is uh, nothing, nothing like a border collie. And that being said, there are so many McNabb lookalikes out there. I mean, you, you can cross a border collie with a Queens and Blue healer and get a dog that looks identical to a McNabb. Really? But their working style isn't there. What and that's how you missing? tell the difference. You, you get, there's only two ways, their working style and a DNA test. Okay. Is there another breed of dog that you've worked with that um, could almost fool you by the working style? That it looks, yeah, that's kind of like a McNabb. You know, uh, the Catahoula even though they, they have no, no similarity to what a McNabb looks like, their working style is similar, but uh, they are very much hard-headed dogs. I had a McNabb, I mean a Catahoula, that I used for catching singles. His name was Mikey. He weighed 110 pounds. And he would get a hold of a cow and literally bring a thousand pound cow down. He'd latch on, hang on. And that was good for catching singles, but he was not very good for herding a, a group of cattle because he wanted to single something out and get a hold. And so uh, McNabs are, are, even though the working style was similar, they don't get a hold and hang on. They don't. Uh, they have a very, what should I say, a sense, not sensitive, but uh, a willingness to please. I'll put it that way. Uh, okay. You don't have to, to get hard with them in order to uh, have them do what you want to do because they're, they're, they want to help you with it. They want to please you because they're, they're more of a one man, one family type dog. And once they made that a, attachment, to you that bond they won't listen to anybody else they are your dog okay okay that's fascinating i i'm i'm trying to you know not having ever ever experienced working um cattle at 
at all with dogs and not having worked with McNabs, I'm kind of putting together an image of how this works based on reading a bunch of your stories in your book, uh, which is called Lessons from the Range Adventures of a Working Cowboy, by the way. It's a good opportunity to slip that in there. Um, I, plug I really there, gotta, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, go download it. I got, I got a kick out of it. Although, Gary, on Amazon, um, it, it's, it's going currently for about $545. So Yes. I have heard that just lately. <laughs> you probably better go to get Kindle, either that or contact me direct. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I went the Kindle route rather than spending the the five hundred bucks. But, uh, um, but those those stories, I think, do give you an image of. Um, at least it, it's given me an image of how the McNab works. Now, let me see if it's an accurate picture. Um, so a McNab is going to go right to the front and they're going to stop cattle um, and they're pretty aggressive in, in they have a reliable bite. I, 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 this is just what I'm gathering from reading your book. Um, but can you expect the McNabs to actually gather and bring cattle back, um, back to where you are, or is it more like a bang of the cattle and, and getting them under control, and then you go in on horseback and start driving the cattle where you want them to go? Well, that's a good question, Aaron. That's a very good question because I have one dog. His name is Benji. He's 19 years old, still working. I have given over 40 demonstrations with that dog. Now, his when he was a pup, his natural instinct was to go to the front, stop, circle, and hold. But I wanted to train him to do other things. So as I was training him to bring cattle back to me, to work one side or the other, to drive cattle, uh, he got to the point where I didn't have to give him any commands at all. If I was driving cattle, he'd stay out in the front and he'd just keep them slowed down. He'd be moving back and forth, keeping them slowed down. If I turned and rode away, he'd bring the cattle to me. If I rode one side, he'd ride the other side. I worked the other side. And that's what makes these McNabs so unique is they're so smart. They can be trained to do anything you want. I know of two of my dogs that are cadaver dogs. Really? I know of two of my other, two of my other dogs that, that uh, uh, are now drug testing dogs. They find drugs. I know one that's owned by the FBI to find bombs. I know of two that's owned by a, 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 a police officer up in Northern California. He uses one for a police dog and the other one he uses to find guns. When they raid somebody's home, this dog goes in and he finds guns that are hidden within the, 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 the building. Dogs are so wow. smart, they can do anything. They Frisbee dogs, agility dogs, uh, pets, whatever, but they got to have a job. They're not, if, if you're, if you're just going to put them in a backyard someplace, it's not going to work. I see. I but see. they, they, whatever you want to teach them, they're willing to learn and they're going okay. to learn. They're smart. Okay. Now, now you mentioned in your book that you don't use your McNabs to drive. Um, because it's it's too exhausting for them and and i assume since you do you work on horseback most of the time you can handle the driving with the with the horses uh but but you're not saying that a mcnab couldn't be used to drive or taught to drive exactly and and i used to use my dogs for driving and but the trouble is and I have found because I, I specialized in catching wild and spoiled livestock my whole life. And, and once those dogs are driving, they get tired. Well, if those cattle break and drop down into a canyon and these dogs are tired and you try to get them to go to the front and stop them, they can't do it. I so see. I've, I've trained my dogs to stay behind my horse. I don't want them out there chasing squirrels or rabbits or, or anything, I want them to stay right behind my horse, walk in the shade of my horse if they can. And that way, when I need them, they're fresh, I can send them out, they can stop the cattle or control the cattle 
whatever it takes, and then we can regroup and go again. But uh, they will drive cattle if you teach them to drive cattle. Okay. Okay. Have you um, have you had any experience using your McNabs on sheep? And have you have any of the pups that you've sold been, gone to um, owners who mostly work with sheep or sheep and goats? Yes, uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of my clients that use the sheep, you know, to uh, use their dogs for working smaller animals, sheep and goats. Uh, I have had dogs in the past that I've because of uh, clients wanting their dogs trained on sheep, and I would start one of my dogs on sheep to get them as a trainer for pups. Okay. It's just like, I, I take the credit, but my dogs actually train the pups. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there was an example uh, last year I had uh, Benji, my 19 year old. I took him out in the back of the arena with the puppies and he wasn't doing anything. He just laid down in the middle of the arena. He did, he could care less. And the two pups were working these fresh cattle that I brought home. And these cattle were really fresh. And all of a sudden, one of these heifers decided, you know what, I'm tired of this. And she started chasing those pups. That old dog jumped up, grabbed that heifer by the nose, spun her around, put her back in the herd. Then he laid down and he goes, that's how you do it, boys. <laughs> and so, yeah, they, it, it, these dogs are so smart. It, it's just amazing. Okay. Um, let's see. Now I'm going to ask you to maybe uh, to to uh, maybe not get a hundred percent behind your favorite breed here. But do you feel like there's an advantage with sheep and goats to having a dog with more eye, more border collie like uh, behaviors than um, the typical working style of the McNabb, or do you think that? Th the McNabb is just as good on sheep and goats as it is on cattle. You know what? It, it depends on what you want. Now I've had, uh, in my training career, I've had a lot of people bring me border collies and want a little more bite in their dogs because they've got a ram in the bunch that wants to bully the dog. And yes, I, I agree that, uh, border collies and sheep usually are a little better uh, just because they they don't have the bite. And of course, you know, a, a sheep rips up pretty easily if, it, if you've got a dog that bites. And so I would say the border collies make a little better sheep dog. However, that McNabb can be trained just as to be just as adequate and as a border collie, but it takes more training uh more control to where uh when the dog gets to the front you lay him down rather than have a border collie that has an automatic down and uh, they can be used as, as, as good sheep dogs okay well and i ask those questions kind of selfishly because i'm a i raise sheep and goats and i'm looking for a, for a well through the process of this uh many episodes of this podcast i'm hoping to arrive at a breed and uh so that's why i asked those questions um i think we probably got some audience members out there who would like to to know about the application of the McNabb on sheep and goats too um let's go back a little bit you mentioned that you have four different lines of McNabb that you feel like have distinct personalities and traits um tell me how do you how do you match up a puppy buyer or even a started dog buyer to the right line. Um, what, what kind of person needs this line from Gary Williams as opposed to that line? Well, Aaron, I sell between 60 and 80 puppies a year. Oh, wow. And almost all my puppies are pre-ordered before conception. Uh, I take deposits on my pups and I have uh, my clients tell me what they want in a dog, color, sex, what they're going to use the dog for. And I actually match the puppies according to what their description is. And so if they wanted a, a dog that's way low, low keyed and easy going, 
you know, I've got dogs that are that way and I cross those dogs that way purposely. And then if somebody says, well, I want a really aggressive watchdog, uh, a real hard biting dog. Uh, I've got dogs I can cross that way too, but it's all in the description. And I'm very proud of, of how I can match those puppies to the personalities of the people. Right. Yeah. I think that's really important. I mean, and, and having those options to be, you know, so many breeders might have just, you know, a couple of females and one male dog and they'll be trying to select um, particular puppies out of a litter that might match what the owner needs, but they can't go to, you know, one of four different lines to select that just right dog for that. Very family. true. Very true. Yeah. And so, the, and, and years ago I had to do that, you know, before I got to the point where I am now, uh, and as a good, as a good breeder, you can generally pick puppies in a litter that are a little bit more shy, a little bit more laid back. But the problem is, is I have people call, you know, they, they want, I want a red and white female with a white collar and I want it with a dock tail or I want it with a tail. And, and so I, at four to 10 days old is when I dock those tails if, if that's what they want. And so I pick the puppy as the description in color, sex and tail or not at four to 10 days old. And well, they don't even have a personality at that point. Right. And so, right. They get what they get and that's why i i prefer them to tell me what they're going to use the dog for that way i can match that particular line to them sure yeah that makes total sense do you find that um puppy buyers are honest with themselves about what they want and need or do they sometimes have ideas you know, I, I want that tough guy, dog with a lot of bite, but maybe they're not, that's not what they actually need. And they're just not being honest with themselves about it. Well, Aaron, you know, I had one pup returned. All right, I take that back Two. I had two puppies returned uh, over the years. And one of them was uh, just recently where it was their first dog. And the dog had too much anxiety for them and they brought the dog back which was fine and i put him on facebook and he was <laughs> he was gone in 10 minutes but sure. uh they didn't realize what they you know and and even though i tried to uh tell them what a mcnab is and that they have to have a job and they have you know, you're, you're either a runner or you, you want to throw a frisbee or you want to throw a ball or you get a, a cattle uh, and so some people don't realize that in the beginning, the other pup right. that I got back, the man told me he wouldn't, she wouldn't work cattle. I had her two days. She was working cattle. And so these McNabs are, are really funny. If you don't make that bond with them, they're not going to work for you. You got to make them think you're the best thing that ever happened to them. <laughs> and once they do, they're locked on to you and they'll do anything you ask. Uh, but growing up, my, what, when my dad and I uh, had that ranch together, once we started getting the, the McNabs put together, he would have his dogs and I would have my dog. And my dogs wouldn't work for him. And his dogs wouldn't work for me. I mean, we'd ride off in different directions. My dogs go with me, his dogs go with him. But even at times, he would try to get my dog to do something and they'd look at him like, what's that mean? What's that command? I've never heard that command before. And he's using the same commands I would. Right. But just like we've got chickens and we've got horses and I've got cattle here because of the drought, I've got a whole lot of cattle here that I'm having to feed. Uh, but my dogs don't work them. They don't look at the chickens. They don't look at the horses because they aren't trained to do that. 
The Board of Collies, on the other hand, they want to work everything that moves. They want to work the bicycle rolling down the road. They want to work the car that's moving. They want to work the horses. They want to work the chickens. They want to work anything that's moving. Whereas the McNabb has to be trained to work that. And I see. That's what I really like about the McNabs. And and one thing also, Aaron, that I've been doing uh, purposely is trying to breed my dogs with pricked ears, ears that stand up. And the reason for that is I live in an area where foxtails and cockleburs are really bad. And a ear that fall folds over traps the weeds in the ear. Whereas ears that are stand up straight, the dog can shake the weeds out of their ears. And so I really try purposely to breed that into them. They don't, not all my pups come out that way, but probably 95% of them do. Okay. Okay. That I've, I've got two questions. I don't want to forget the second one, but you've, you've brought to mind a couple of things. One, you mentioned how, you know, the McNabb is really loyal and focused on one person. Um, do you sell uh, started dogs or finished dogs that you raised from the time they were pup pups? And if so, how easy is it to transfer all of that training over to a new owner? And, uh, and that's a good question, Aaron, because uh, when I sell a trained dog, I tell the owner, don't even turn this dog loose for 30 days. If you turn him loose, he's going to come looking for me. No matter where he's at, you're you're going to lose your dog. I says, for 30 days, you keep him on the leash in the house or wherever, but you have to make that bond with him. Once you make that bond, he's your dog. Mm. But until then, he thinks he's still my dog and he's going to come and find me. And I have had people... <laughs> Uh, one, one, one in particular, I left one of my collars on the dog with my name tag. The man told me, Gary said, I don't, I thought the dog really liked me. And he said, I turned him loose. He said, have you heard anything? About three days later, I had to call him back and I said, yeah. I said, he's in a different state. <laughs> Fortunately, my caller was still on him. The man called me and said, what is your dog doing back here in Texas? I go, the man didn't uh, keep him on a leash. Oh my God. And then I had another one that uh, the man told me, he says, I thought he liked me. He said, he, I had him in the back of the pickup, drove to the corrals. And he says, he, he licks my face and he, he really showed me that he liked me. But he says, as soon as I let, let him out of that pickup, he took off down the road. He said, I called him and called him and called him. He wouldn't even look back at me. He ran out in front of a car and got killed. Oh, no. So it's very important on these older dogs to make the bond. You have to make that bond. And once you do, huh, they, they, I literally, I've got two of my dogs here living in the house. I can't get in the bathroom without them. I can't get that door shut without them coming into the bathroom with me. <laughs> they are so, so locked on to me. <laughs> right. Right. That's great. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. So as to their physical traits, you mentioned their pricked ears. You mentioned that you had gotten, uh, some of your breeding stock out of Missouri. Um, but really, the, the McNabb has been bred for stamina in hot weather, dry places, a certain type of vegetation and landscape. How well do they adapt to other parts of the country? Very well. As a matter of fact, where, where I was in Oregon, uh, it was nothing to get down to 20 below. Mm. The only thing I did uh, to assist them in that cold weather is I put canvas in front of their uh, the openings for their doghouse where they could go in and out and that canvas would, would, uh, hold the heat in there. And of course, good, good bedding as well. But, uh, other than that, they did just, just fine. Okay. Okay. And but, they're uh, well, close, close coats. They have, they've got plenty of coat, even though it's a, um, a close coat there's. Yeah. It, uh, and 
And I'll say this, uh, if they're long haired, if they have a blue eye, if they are over 60 pounds, they're not a McNabb. Really? Okay. Really? What are they? What, they're what crossed with a border collie, or they're, or another breed, or an Australian Shepherd, or something. With exactly. The eye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but you mentioned that uh, you know way back in the the early days of the McNabb that they were crossed with border collies. Is that correct? That's correct. There's several different versions of the history. And apparently John McNabb, who was Alexander's son, brought back uh, later on in the early 1900s uh, straight fox shepherds and crossed back into those lines and kept it pretty, pretty pure. However, uh, early days, any working dog, they would cross back and call it a McNabb. And okay. And so what I did during my breeding program in the early years, in, in the 70s and 80s, is if I got any uh, blue eyed or, or a little bit longer hair or uh, any, any characteristic that I didn't think was from the McNabb line, I would call that out. Okay. So that it wasn't in my line anything at all longer and I would stay away from that. And so that's why now i've got i've got uh, dogs that were tested 100 percent mcnap no, no border collie whatsoever in flow but it's because of my culling of anything that was uh not appropriate for the mcnap breed and I, I just would stay away from that line okay yeah that makes sense that's that's really interesting i'm sure that um you know, there are a lot of McNabs, uh, dogs out there that people call McNabs that have an awful lot of uh, other herding breeds in them, including Border Collies um, and and vice versa. Um, is there a club of any kind or a breeding associ breed association that kind of regulates this? Or you already mentioned that your dogs are registered with the Stock Dog Association. Are there any other uh, organizations providing any guidance on that? Well, they have a uh, McNabb registry uh, that had just been just started here in the last, I believe, year, year and a half, two years at the very most. And uh, it's gotten off the ground. Okay. And I, and I know several of the breeders and, and almost all of them have my line of dogs in there and they've purchased puppies from me in the past. And, uh, uh, you know what? What I'm not sure what their their breeding program is. Whether they're staying 100% with McNabs or or crossing other breeds into them, or you know, I all I can say is I, they started with my lines and they do have my lines. So, gotcha. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the questions that I like to ask every guest that I have on is, um, do you have a a favorite farm dog and I and I found that people don't like to answer that question because they say it's like picking their favorite kid but in your memory all the dogs you've had is there one in particular that stands out or if you'd rather not an, as, answer that question is there a particular dog story you'd like to tell that is a favorite memory of yours gosh that you know I, I do have one dog in particular that that uh that he passed away a couple of years ago. His name was Jack. He was as close to being family as a dog can possibly be. And I've got, I've had great dogs and I still have some wonderful dogs laying at my feet right now. Uh, but, uh, but Jack was pretty special. Jack was special. I, uh, I, when I had to put him down, I cried like a baby for a week. <laughs> it, was, it was just ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I didn't think I could ever get that close to a dog. You know what I mean? But it, yeah. But he was awesome. He was just, just a, a, almost a total, complete black dog. Pricked ears, 
beautiful shiny coat, not a white hair on him. But he was he was a gorgeous dog. What made him special? His ability, his performance, his personality? Well, he was probably the typical McNabb. Very protective of me. He was, uh, but very controllable. I mean, I could lay him down and and uh, he wouldn't wouldn't bother anybody, wouldn't do anything, you know. And and yet, uh, I guarantee you I could lay my sleeping bag down in the on the streets of New York and have that dog lay on that sleeping bag and nobody would mess with me. <laughs> he was great that way, but he was also oh, just an amazing cattle dog. I'd watch him out gathering cattle and especially on wild cattle that stay in the brush. And uh, he would stand up on his hind legs like a bear and he'd take the scent off the, the breeze and he would go as far as a half mile to find those cattle. He was pretty amazing. He was a great dog. Gary, t tell me that story again. You're cutting out just a little bit, but you said, uh, yeah, you were just telling me a story about his performance. I, I uh, when I was gathering cattle, wild cattle like to stay in the brush and they stay in the steepest, steepest and most rugged country there is. That's what makes them wild. Mm -hmm. And this dog would stand up on his hind legs like a bear and he'd take the scent off the breeze. You couldn't see cattle. You didn't even know there was cattle anywhere around, but when he'd see, when I'd see him do that, I could send him, I'd just tell him, get ahead. And off he'd go, and it might take him a half, half mile. Pretty soon you could hear him barking. He'd have everything stopped and circled up and held up. He was amazing. He's a great dog. <laughs> That's excellent. Gary, let's. I'm going to pause just for a second, and I'm going to tweak my internet connection here because I'm having a little bit of trouble, and I don't want to have you have to keep repeating yourself. So bear with me. That's okay. So. Go for it. All right. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so Jack is your favorite farm dog, and uh, thanks for sharing that story with us. That's that's really great to hear. Um, how long ago did you have Jack? Oh, he's been gone now probably three years. Okay. Like that. So there are uh, plenty of pups out there who uh, are Jack's progeny, and those are some lucky Oh, yes. Pups. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ace, who is laying here at my feet, is... is part of his bloodlines. Okay, that's awesome. Um, Gary, we're headed toward uh, out the door here, but I wonder if you could just tell us if McNabs have a weakness or a weakness or two, what is it? Like what, what would a potential McNab owner need to know? You know, the, uh, I can't really say that they have a weakness, you know, uh, The way I breed my dogs, I breed them to work livestock. And that is what they were meant to do, okay? That being said, that puts the drive in those dogs. And without drive, you can't teach a dog to do a, a variety of, of jobs. And because I, I really push that drive into those dogs, they are capable of doing any job that they're trained to do and for people that that uh, that want a McNabb need to understand that even though they make that bond to you and they're they're your your companion for life you need to have a job for them to do uh like i i mentioned before living in a backyard with no uh human contact that that probably be their weakness okay and and really you know for um 
well-bred stock dogs. That's kind of a, a a common warning regardless of breed too, right? I mean, those those dogs are bred to be working dogs and they need a task. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gary, uh, what would you like the folks to know about you? Where can they find you? Um, maybe take a second here and just pitch your book and tell us what that what it's all about and uh, why you set out to write it. Well, it's uh, Lessons from the Range. And <laughs> I started uh, writing the book because my wife, who had been nagging me for 20 years to do that. <laughs> and I thought about it, you know, I thought, you know what? My dad had some wonderful, wonderful stories. And, but he never wrote them down and never got recorded. And I remember some of them bits and pieces. And I thought, you know what? If nobody buys a single book, if I can write this down for my family, my grandchildren, great grandchildren, and we have 14 grandchildren and two great grandchildren. And for them to be able to see what I have done in my lifetime, it would be worth it. So I decided to, well, that might, might be something I want to do. And so I, I really considered, but I got on a, uh, a job to go down South and gather a lady's cattle and going down, we got to talking and, and she says, wow, you really got some great stories. You need to write a book. And I go, yeah, my wife's been telling me that for years <laughs> and nothing more was said. About a week later, here come a package in the mail. In the package was a note from this lady. I want your first book. <laughs> Inside the package was a handheld tape recorder. So I put that tape recorder on the, on the dashboard of my pickup when I had windshield time going back and forth to different jobs. I'd get to thinking about stuff and I pretty soon I had that tape recorder full of stories. And, you know, I believe God really had a, a, a hand in this because as I was typing out this book that my wife decided that I needed to do on my own, she had a client, one of her tax clients came to her and says, uh, he could, she told him that he, uh, her husband was writing a book. He says, well, you need to have him come and talk to me. I'm the head of the graphics department at Cal Poly and we write books. <laughs> So that's how that all came together. And, and uh, it, it's been an amazing adventure. We've, I've done radio talk shows, book writing, uh, speaking to other authors. And it's been a, an amazing adventure for this cowboy. But uh, I'm on my second edition, sold out all the first edition books. And, and, uh, and it's been a, a great ride, it really has. Well, that's great. I I really enjoyed reading uh, the stories in your book. It's an it's um, it's an easy, quick read. It just keeps moving right along, and um, it's it's just been really fun. And I I think somewhat importantly too, I think it gives folks like me who don't know what it's like to work cattle on range from horseback and with dogs, like a, a little taste of what it's like and. Um, think also a little taste of what good horses and good dogs are capable of i think we we probably often undersell them you know and and, <laughs> uh, and and try to do it other ways and don't fully appreciate what has been bred into those animals for a long long time so thank you for bringing that to us the the book again is called lessons from the range adventures of a working cowboy by gary williams um, I'm going to just plug your website too, it, it, Gary Williams McNab Dogs dot com. Uh, does that sound correct, Gary? That's correct. And McNab and my, is my email address is uh, Cowboy Dog Trainer at Gmail dot com. Cowboy Dog Trainer at Gmail dot com. And uh, I get the sense from talking with you, Gary, that you're just willing to answer people's questions. I mean, how many people put their email and phone number right on their website and invite you to call them? So um, 
uh, Gary's been really gracious in my reaching out to him and joining us tonight uh, on this podcast. So I'm sure he'll extend the same favor to you if you want to get in touch with him. Gary, thanks again. It's been a blast. I've learned a lot and I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Aaron. Thank you for having me. You bet. Have a good night. You also. Bye-bye.